welcome to the live. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes to give um, people a chance to join, but if you are in my Zoom waiting room or you've joined already, welcome. I'm so excited to have you guys here for our first official Study With Me Live. So i um, really excited to do these and I will be offering these um, lives weekly. So just to give you guys uh, an additional resource in your pocket, whether you're going to nursing school or you're studying for your NCLEX. So hopefully you'll find this helpful um, and you'll continue to join me every week. So, all right, let me just see here. And if you are watching live, if you can do me a favor and just drop in the comment where you're watching from. I always find that so interesting, um, social media to see like how far uh, we reach people. So I find it so interesting um, to find out where everyone is watching from. So if you are watching, if you can go ahead and do me a favor and just drop me a comment, show me some love um, and let me know where you're watching from. And then if you are tuning in through Zoom, through my university group, um, I do have my team helping to watch um, all of my chats and all of my um, platforms. So if you have a question, feel free to um, drop it in the chat, whether that be in Zoom or on um, the lives for my platforms. I do have uh, my team helping me out. So um, I'll make sure to answer all of your questions. We will have time for a Q&A at the end, but. So we're halfway through the week, so hopefully everyone's week is going well and it's going fast. Um, I know I always love Wednesday. That's one step closer to Friday, so. All right, and I'm just gonna ask uh, my team, did you confirm, are we live on Facebook? Everything looks good? Live on YouTube, live on Facebook. Perfect. All right, so we will go ahead and get started then. So again, thank you for tuning in with me live for this little study sesh. Um, it's a little late where I am, well, not too late, it's a little after nine o'clock, but um, when you have kids, nine o'clock is late. So, um, but I'm so excited to be here with you all. And like I said, just give you guys some more tips and tricks that you can use um, to help you study in nursing school or to help you uh, study and uh, pass your NCLEX on your next attempt. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. I'm so excited to hang out with you. Um, and just some housekeeping items. Um, so this is not only gonna help you with this study session, but I also talk about it um, in my NCLEX and Chill review about um, how you can maximize your study time. So I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks, again, not just for uh, this study session, but while you're uh, studying in general. So the first tip is to limit your distractions. Um, the more you get distracted by, uh, you know, kids or loud TV in the background or notifications on your phone, um, that breaks your concentration. So you want to make sure that you try to limit as many distractions as you uh, possibly can. Um, and let me just click, I just forgot. Click, okay. Um, so again, make sure that you uh, limit those distractions and also find a quiet place. Um, again, that just ties into uh, being distracted um, or having those interruptions. And I know that that is easier said than done. Um, I have a 11 month old, soon to be one year old. So I know, um, you know, he makes a lot of noise. He needs a lot of attention. So sometimes that is difficult, but try to pick a um, time and a place that is conducive for you. And it's going to create that 
um, really conducive study environment. So try to find a quiet place if you can. Um, lock yourself in a pantry if you have to. <laughs> um, going to you know a quiet bookstore or a coffee shop with noise canceling headphones is always a good idea. Um, I know we have COVID right now, but um, if you can get to a quiet place, that would be ideal. And then again, turning off all cell phone notifications. I know that I am streaming live on social media, so most of you are probably watching um, on your cell phone, uh, which is completely fine, but you wanna make sure that you're not distracted by notifications, especially when you are sitting down and you are studying. And again, turning off the TV, the TV is also an added distraction. So it's best to try to study uh, when you have that TV turned off. All right, and next I just wanna talk a little bit about me. Um, hopefully you guys know a little bit about me, but um, I'm sure I have some new faces here. So I just wanna take just a couple minutes and kinda of tell you um, a little bit about my background and um, why I became a nurse. So um, I have been a nurse for over a decade. I graduated in July of 2009, and sometimes it, it seemed like that was just yesterday, but when I really sit down and think about it, like, wow, I've been a nurse for um, over a decade. And let me just admit this person. Um, so I, when I graduated in 2009, um, I passed my NCLEX on my first attempt at the minimum amount of questions which I was so relieved for, but it was um, definitely a very anxiety-driven process. So that kind of jump-started my mission to help uh, aspiring nurses um, as much as I could to pass their NCLEX as well and also help them going through nursing school because I know that it was a very anxiety-driven process. And um, over the years of becoming a nurse, it's just been so fulfilling and so rewarding um, as soon as I graduated, I worked in a step-down cardiac ICU unit, which I absolutely loved. I gained a lot of experience, um, did that for about a year, and then I transitioned into the emergency department and became a certified trauma nurse. So um, that is a very interesting field. You're kind of the jack of all trades. I love that I used a lot of my clinical skills. Um, because you see everything. You see everything from, you know, bruised knees to, um, you know, massive strokes and heart attacks and cardiac arrests and, and, and a lot of injuries and, and accidents. So you kind of see a little bit of everything when you're working in the ER. So I absolutely love that. I did that for about five years. Um, and about a year of working in the ER, I became a nurse mentor and a preceptor to other new nurses who were um, looking to start their career in the emergency room. And I absolutely fell in love with teaching. Um, I loved mentoring. I loved helping new nurses and really um, guiding them to set them up for success in their nursing career. So um, I knew from a very, uh, very early on in my nursing journey that I wanted to be a nurse mentor and um, be a an inspiration to other nurses. So I didn't quite know how that was going to manifest itself later, but um, after I kind of completed my journey in the ER, um, I started going into a more leadership role. So I became, um, I went into case management at first, and then uh, after case management, I became a, a director of care transitions. And then from there, I became a director of admissions and in business development for a very large national rehab uh, therapy hospital. So um, I had a team of about 10 nurses and therapists and respiratory therapists that um, I led and I managed. And I did that for several years and I absolutely loved it. Um, and then I decided to pursue my career even more in the nurse education um, space. So that led me to uh, create this Nurse Kelly Tyrell um, business, so to speak. Uh, hello, thanks so much for joining. We're just getting started. I'm just um, kind of talking a little bit about myself and, and my nursing career. So you didn't really miss too much, but thanks for joining the, the study with me session. Um, so yeah, so that's how this, you know, Nurse Kelly Tyrell um, movement really started. Um, 
So, and the reason, the ultimate reason why I became a nurse initially, I think I forgot to mention this, was my sister was actually born with a congenital heart defect. So I spent a lot of time in children's hospitals at a very young age. Um, you know, she was quote unquote on her, her deathbed, so to speak, you know, several times she had multiple open heart surgeries. Um, she had tetralogy of flow. So I saw how caring and compassionate those nurses were and they really saved her life more times than I can even count. So, um, I knew since I was a little girl that I wanted to be a nurse. Um, so yeah, so that's just a little bit about, uh, a little bit about my background and um, why I do what I do and why I love helping you all. All right, so let's get into the good part, the, um, the study session. And I do wanna let you guys know, if you stick around until the end, I have some really amazing offers for you guys and I'm also gonna be doing the live Q&A. So um, you can really ask me anything. I'm, I'm an open book, so you can ask me anything, you know, personally or professionally or about the NCLEX, about nursing school, um, whatever's on your mind. So I will have the Q&A at the end. And again, I do have some um, really amazing offers for you guys um, after we, we go through our little uh, study session here. But I thought since um, if you guys don't follow me on YouTube, I am right in the middle of my endocrine series on YouTube. So I thought I would kind of pick up there and uh, we talk a little bit about diabetes mellitus today. So diabetes is a really highly tested topic in nursing school and on the NCLEX because there's a lot of high risk medication that is involved when you're trying to manage a patient who has diabetes. So it's really important that you understand the disease etiology of diabetes and also understand the medication management um, of diabetes and the different education that goes along with um, educating patients who are diagnosed with this life changing, life altering diagnosis. So let's first start by um, what is the role of insulin? So insulin is stored in the pancreas and it's produced by these beta cells that are housed in these little clusters um, inside the pancreas. And the ultimate role of the insulin is um, it's like glucose's best friend. So <laughs> they stick together, insulin will bind to the glucose. And then from there, what it does is it actually moves the glucose from the bloodstream into our cells where it's converted and it's used as our primary energy source. So let me just, okay. So it's used um, as the primary cellular energy. So insulin is really, really important. And like I said, it's a binder to glucose. So that is how it lowers glucose in the bloodstream. It actually sticks to it and then it travels through the blood and then it carries it from the blood into our cells so that way it can be used as energy. And there are several types of diabetes. So your first type of diabetes is your, um, is your insulin dependent diabetes and it's also known as juvenile diabetes. So with your type one, what happens is um, there is some kind of autoimmune problem where the insulin, the beta cells that produce the insulin completely stop working. So usually it's um, the person's own body attacking those beta cells and it causes a complete halt in insulin production. So there's no insulin being produced at all. Then you have type two. So type two diabetes, um, some insulin is being produced, but it's not going to be enough to lower that blood glucose level to a normal level. So you're still gonna have a little bit of insulin production, unlike with type one, where you're not gonna have anything at all. With type two, you're gonna have a little bit, but it's not gonna be enough to bind to all of the glucose that you put inside your, your gut, which goes into your bloodstream. Um, it's not gonna be enough to move everything into the cells, but you are producing a little bit of insulin. And then next you have insulin resistance. So with insulin resistance, this is a precursor to type two diabetes. So with insulin resistance, um, you have sufficient insulin that's being produced, but there is a binding issue or a connection issue. 
So you're ingesting food that has carbohydrates and sugars and it's being converted to glucose in the bloodstream. So you have all this glucose floating around in your bloodstream. Hello, thanks for joining. Um, so you have all this glucose that's in your bloodstream and you're producing enough insulin theoretically to move all of this glucose from your bloodstream into um, the cell so that way they can use them as energy. But the problem is, is that the insulin for whatever reason um, does not want to bind to that glucose. So if the insulin is not binding to that glucose, that means that it can't be transferred out of the bloodstream into the cell. So there's enough insulin being produced. It's just, it's, it's not wanting to bind to that glucose. And if it's not binding, it can't move it from the bloodstream into the cells. And then the last type of diabetes is your gestational diabetes. So um, this only occurs during pregnancy. And um, what happens is there's a lot of demand when you're pregnant. So you're not only eating for yourself, but now you're trying to supply the nutrition um, for the fetus and the baby. Um, so when you do that, typically you um, increase your caloric intake and you also increase your carbohydrates and your sugars. So when you're increasing your calories and your sugars and your carbs, um, ideally you should be producing more insulin. So that way, again, it can latch onto that glucose and it can carry into the cells. Well, with gestational diabetes, um, the pancreas does not produce enough insulin to carry that glucose into the cell so it can be used as energy. Um, and this only happens during pregnancy. So that is what I mean by gestational diabetes. And typically after the woman uh, gives birth, the diabetes is typically resolved. So she doesn't have diabetes, but I will say that it does put her at a lot higher risk later on in life for developing type two diabetes. So she's not quite out of the woods once she delivers the baby. Um, she'll still have to watch later on down the line because she's gonna be at a higher risk for developing um, diabetes later on. All right, so next let's talk about some causes, symptoms, and treatments of diabetes that you'll want to be familiar with. So I touched on this a little bit earlier. So type one is known as juvenile diabetes um, because it typically starts very early on um, during childhood. And again, this typically occurs from some kind of autoimmune process in the body. So um, the patient's own body, typically the pediatric patient, so their own body is actually attacking those beta cells where the insulin is being produced and they are destroying those beta cells. So um, it's going to completely stop and halt all insulin production. And type 2. So what you're going to see um, with type 2 is patients typically develop this diabetes from um, having a poor diet or being overweight or having excess belly fat. Um, so the demand for insulin is going to be higher if somebody is overweight and they have a poor diet and they're eating a lot of sugar um, and they're eating a lot of carbs. So they're increasing that demand of insulin on the pancreas and eventually the pancreas says, wait a minute, I am too tired. There, it, this is too much work. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just going to, you know, limit my insulin production. So that happens because again, because the patient is not eating the way they should, they're overweight and they're carrying a lot of um, excess belly fat. So it's putting a lot of stress on the pancreas and the cells that produce that insulin. And then with insulin resistance, um, genetics can actually play a role um, in insulin resistance. But again, most of the time it's going to be from the same reasons that you develop the type 2 diabetes. It's going to be because of diet, um, being overweight, having that excess belly fat. And then gestational diabetes. So I talked about this a little bit earlier. So um, it's typically, well, it's always going to be pregnancy induced and it typically resolves after delivery. But like I said, the mom is still gonna be at risk for developing that type two diabetes later on in life. So she'll just wanna make sure that she keeps an eye on that. So next let's move on to symptoms. So there are a couple different symptoms that are uh, common for all types of um, diabetes. And then we have some symptoms that are very specific to type one, type two, and insulin resistance. So 
let's start with the uh, symptoms that we have in common for all types of diabetes. So you have polyphagia. So um, poly, uh, if poly is the suffix. So poly means that it is increased. Um, so anytime you see poly, you want to think increased. And then if you split this word up and you look at the second part, which is phagia, phagia actually means eating. Um, so you have an increased eating or increased hunger. And then polydipsia, again, we have poly, which means increased. And then dipsia means thirst. Hey, Leticia, thanks for joining. <laughs> Um, and then if you did miss the beginning of this lecture, I am recording this, so it will post after we are all finished. You can go back and watch the replay, so no worries if you missed the beginning. Um, I know that everyone is busy, so you kind of jump in when you can. But um, So again, so poly means increase, and then dipsia means thirst. So these patients are going to be excessively hungry, and they're going to be really thirsty. So they're going to be drinking a ton of water. And then the third common symptom between all types of diabetes is going to be polyuria. So poly, again, is increased. Urea means your urine. So um, what goes in must come out. So all of that fluid that they're drinking, and the reason why they're drinking so much fluid is because um, you have a process called direct feedback. And really what that means is when one hormone or one chemical is really elevated or really low in the body, the body tries to compensate by doing something else to either increase the level or decrease the level. So what I mean by that is as your sugar gets high in your bloodstream, your body has a certain threshold. So once it gets to typically above 110, um, your body wants to start getting that glucose out of the blood and it wants to move it into the cells. Well, with diabetes, like I said, if you don't have enough insulin to move that glucose out of the blood into the cells, your body's gonna say, wait a minute, something's not right. The sugar level is too high. I need to get it out some other way. So then what your body does is it sends out these thirst signals from your brain and it's going to attempt to try to flush all that glucose out through the kidneys and through the urine. So that's why patients get um, really thirsty. And the reason why they get really hungry is because your cells are being really starved of that energy. So the cells send out signals saying, hey, I need more food because I need to convert that food, those carbohydrates and those sugars into energy. Um, but unfortunately, as the patient increases uh, their food intake, if they don't have enough insulin to support that, it's going to be all for nothing because the insulin's not going to be able to move it into the cells anyway. So that's why you have that increased hunger and that's why you have that increased thirst. And then the urine, like I said, what goes in must come out. So if you're drinking all that fluid, um, your body's trying to flush all that extra glucose out of the bloodstream through the urine. So you're going to have this polyuria. And then the last common symptom is going to be infections and delayed wound healing because all of that extra glucose, that, that sweet sugary glucose, that is a breeding ground for bacteria and infection. So um, anytime you have a patient with diabetes, you always wanna be thinking about um, any kind of wounds, even just a simple ulcer on the toe um, can lead to detrimental consequences. It can lead to osteomyelitis and it can lead to amputation. So, um, you never want to dismiss a patient who has a little cut on their foot, um, if they are diabetic, because very quickly, because of all of that sugar, they're going to be at a really high risk for developing really severe infections and sepsis and, um, gangrene and osteomyelitis and things like that. So now let's talk about symptoms that are not in common for each of the types of diabetes. So for type one, with this diabetes, like I said, it's gonna happen at a young age. So these are often gonna be pediatric patients and it's gonna happen really, really fast. So in other words, it's gonna be an acute onset. Um, and again, that's because, um, like I said, there's no insulin production at all. So your body can't even attempt to try to compensate because there is literally no insulin production at all. So this is going to happen really fast. It's going to be an acute onset. And then they're also going to have that rapid weight loss. So um, again, the patient is going to be experiencing that increased hunger that we just talked about, but because they have zero insulin in their bloodstream, 
um, they're not going to be able to move any of that glucose into the cell. So what happens then is that the patient starts losing weight really, really rapidly. So that is very classic of type 1. And then type 2, that is going to be a slow or what's called an insidious onset. Um, and the patient may actually be asymptomatic at all because our bodies they always try to compensate before they completely crash. So um, with type two, like I said, you do have some insulin that's being produced. So your body for a period of time is going to try and compensate. So um, the patient may, may be asymptomatic for a little while, um, and then they may not even know that they have diabetes until they go in for some routine blood work and they find out that they have an elevated A1C and they have glucose in their urine. Um, so, but they may be actually asymptomatic for a while because our bodies always try to compensate as much as they can. And then the insulin resistance. So the number one, hey, Julia, thanks for joining. Um, if you missed the beginning of this presentation, no worries at all. I am recording it. So, um, I'll be posting it later. Let me just, uh. Sorry guys, I feel like I'm cutting off the screen here. Oh. There we go. Make me a little bit smaller so that way you guys can see. Okay. So um, the symptoms that are not in common. So for insulin resistance, the uh, number one symptom that you're gonna look for is the patient is gonna have normal blood insulin levels. So that is going to be your key symptom that is going to be completely different from all of the other types of diabetes. All the other types of diabetes, you're gonna have um, lower insulin levels with a high blood sugar level. So the reason why the insulin level is going to be normal with insulin resistance, because if you remember what I had just talked about, it's not an insulin production issue with insulin resistance, it's a binding issue. So um, your pancreas is still very capable of producing um, all the insulin that your body really needs, but it just, there's a connection and a binding issue. So it's not binding to those cells. So um, your, your blood insulin levels are going to be normal with patients who have insulin resistance. Um, and gestational diabetes. So again, what differentiates that is that it only occurs in pregnancy. So gestational diabetes, you can compare it uh, very closely to type two diabetes. Um, so again, in the beginning, uh, patients with gestational diabetes may actually be asymptomatic. They may not know, um, but if you've ever been pregnant, then you know that you go, I think it's the second trimester, um, you go typically for a, a fasting glucose test um, to check for uh, gestational diabetes because a lot of times women are asymptomatic and they don't really know that they have developed it because again, the body's trying to compensate, but it mimics very much so like a type two diabetes. Um, and sometimes women with gestational diabetes can control the diabetes with um, just changing their diet. And sometimes they will need to be placed on insulin. So it just really depends on the severity and how early it's caught. All right, so next let's talk about treatments for each of these types of diabetes. So um, for type one, so the treatment is going to be very strict blood glucose monitoring um, and also insulin management. So uh, for these types of patients, because again, there is no insulin being produced at all, typically you're gonna see that these patients are on some kind of implanted insulin pump um, and their uh, insulin is going to be managed that way. So it's really important um, to educate these patients on how to use their insulin pump. Um, and uh, there's a lot of psychological factors that I will say that goes into juvenile diabetes, especially when um, you know kids are being diagnosed as, as pre-teenagers or teenagers. Um, sometimes they're very difficult to treat because they don't understand the severity of this disease and what it can do to them long term. So I know when I worked in the ER, I, I had several young patients that would come in um, in something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which um, basically results from having too much blood sugar and really poorly controlled diabetes. Um, and they come in 
Um, if you guys are if you guys are on my Zoom call in university, um, I am running out of time. They only give me 45 minutes. So um, if you guys want to hop on Facebook, you can catch the live on Facebook. Um, or I will see if my husband, the technical person, if he can try to send out and post a new link um, for the Zoom um, in the university group. But um, if I can't do that, I'm sorry, the Zoom only lets me go to 45 minutes. Um, you can hop on over to Facebook or YouTube Live. Just go to my page or go to YouTube Live and then you can catch the rest of the live there. But I'm gonna ask him and see, um, or my other technical guy, I know he's on the call, Chris, if you can hear me, if you can try to figure out how to get another link and then send it um, in the university group so that way everyone can rejoin. I don't know if we can do that, but. Um, if we can't, then, um, then again, you can just hop on Facebook and you can join there. Um, so anyways, like I was saying, so working in the ER, you know, I saw a lot of kids that come in, um, because they just, you know, they, they didn't understand like how important it was. And there's a loss of control too, with this diagnosis, you know, um, I'm working on my pediatric lectures uh, for uh, YouTube that are going to be coming out, I think, in like a week or two weeks or so. And I talk about the developmental stages of um, adolescence. And, um, you know, they want to maintain their independence. And uh, it's a struggle for them. It's a struggle for them to have this, you know, life altering diagnosis and have to monitor their, their glucose levels and, and monitor their insulin pumps. So, um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, they just, they just don't do it. And then they end up, you know, in the ER really, really sick with diabetic ketoacidosis. So that is a major complication of type one diabetes. Um, and then type two, so the treatments for type two. So that is going to be um, primarily lifestyle changes. That's what they're going to want to try first is diet and exercise. Um, again, because like I said, there's still some insulin being produced, so there is still a chance that you can actually reverse the diabetes um, through changes in diet and exercise. Because if you are ingesting um, a lower amount of carbohydrates and sugars, or if you're exercising to burn off um, the carbohydrates and sugars, then your pancreas is not going to need to produce um, as much insulin. So. Uh, you want to make sure that you're educating. I'm sorry about my dogs in the background. They get a little wild sometimes. I have three Siberian Huskies, so um, I apologize for the noise in the background. But um, so you want to make sure that you are educating these patients on diet and exercise, um, and uh, and really encouraging them to make these lifestyle changes to prevent them from having to inject themselves with insulin later, because it is not fun to have to um, inject yourself with insulin multiple times a day. Uh, the next uh, treatment is going to be that strict uh, blood glucose monitoring, just like type one. Um, and then the insulin management as needed. Like I said, um, sometimes these patients don't need to be placed on insulin right away if they can manage um, their diabetes through changes in their diet and their exercise. All right, so next let's talk about some insulin management here. So this here is um, my insulin cheat sheet that I created. And um, if you are a member of my university community, then this should look familiar to you because my endocrine cheat sheets are available to download until the end of the month. So if you are in my community, then hopefully you've already downloaded your uh, cheat sheets and you would have um, already had access to this. But if you are not in my university community, um, stick around and I will talk about that and how that can um, really help propel you forward in nursing school and also help you um, with your NCLEX. But um, so it's really important to uh, memorize some of these insulins and um, when their onset of action is, when their peak times are, and when their duration is. Because um, when you're, again, like I said, these are very high risk medications and nurses have inadvertently given patients um, the wrong type of insulin they've given them instead of units of insulin, they've given them MLs of insulin. So they've overdosed patients with the insulin. Um, we, there have been fatalities um, all across the country from uh, misuse of insulin. Um, so it's really important that you as the nurse be familiar with these different types of insulins. 
Um, so first we're gonna start with the rapid acting insulin. So that is typically your Novolog, your Apidra, and your Humil Humilog. So the onset for these are 15 minutes. That's why they're called rapid acting, rapid acting insulin. So you're going to want to make sure that you give these insulins at least 15 minutes um, prior to the patient eating because if you give them um, if you give them longer than 15 minutes then you can actually drop that patient's blood glucose level so you want to make sure that you are the ideal administration time is going to be 15 minutes before the patient has sits down and they have their meal and then they're really going to peak at 30 to 60 or 30 to 90 minutes is going to be their peak duration time so again you want to make sure that you have checked the patient's blood glucose level um, and that you are administering this insulin the time frame of like 15 to 30 minutes before they sit down for their meal. And they stay in the bloodstream for about three to five hours. So you wanna keep that in mind that patients are gonna be at risk for dropping their blood sugar level um, three to five hours after you give this injection. Even though you know they may have eaten if they did not eat enough, um, then there is a chance that a few hours later you're gonna see their blood sugar levels drop. So you wanna remember that it stays in your system for about three to five hours for these rapid actings. Next, we'll talk about the short and the intermediate actings because these two types of insulins are going to be the insulins that you're typically going to mix together to give to patients if you don't have your pre-mixed combos. Um, so your short acting, those are gonna be your regular insulins, and that's typically Humulin R and Novolin R. And again, they have an onset time of 30 to 60 minutes. So your ideal time frame is to give these insulins about 30 minutes before the patient is sitting down to eat their meal. They have a peak time of two to four hours, and then a total duration of five to eight hours. And then your intermediate acting insulin, that's gonna be your Humulin N, and your uh, Novolin N, or they're also known as the NPH insulins. Um, again, their onset is going to be one to three hours. They have a peak time of eight hours, and they have a total duration of 12 to 16 hours. Um, and then I, there is also long-acting insulins, which I did not put on the sheet, but I will add it. But your long-acting insulins, that is going to be like your Lantus, um, and that is typically given once a day at bedtime, and that provides coverage um, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. So you're not going to be mixing those long acting insulins with any other insulin. Um, like I said, when you're talking about insulin mixing, it's typically going to be your short acting insulin and then your intermediate acting insulin. And then they do have those pre-mixed combos where you don't have to manually mix, they're already mixed for you. Um, so uh, again, their onset is gonna be 30 to 60 minutes and their peak time really varies. Um, so you have to look and see what exactly is in those mixed combos in order to find out what their peak time is. And their average duration is um, 10 to 16 hours. So yeah, um, I don't know how to get, I don't know how to get it back. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, yeah, I did tell them to, um, I did tell them to log in on Facebook if they lose the Zoom, but, all right, so now let's talk about mixing insulin. This is a um, highly tested topic, and it's a, uh, it's a good skill to have. It's a necessary skill to have when you are a nurse, knowing how to mix um, insulin. And again, this is another cheat sheet in my university community, so... Um, if you are not already joined to that, then you want to make sure that you join after this call um, because we uh, you'll get these endocrine um, system downloads. But when you are mixing insulin, so what is the purpose of mixing insulin? Why don't we just give them separately? Well, if you are a patient with diabetes and you are having to inject yourself with insulin multiple times a day, you want to try to limit the amount of injections that you get if you can. Um, so the ultimate purpose of mixing these insulins is um, mainly for convenience, honestly, for the patient. So that way we're not having to give them two injections when we really could be giving them one. Um, and then important points to keep in mind 
Um, again, like I said, you never want to mix your long-acting insulin. So the Lantus, like I talked about, you don't want to mix that with any other type of insulin. You're going to interfere with the action of the Lantus. So you don't want to mix those with any other type of insulin. Um, and then another important point to keep in mind is you want to administer the insulin within... Uh, sorry about that. Um, so you want to administer that insulin within five to 10 minutes after drawing it up because that regular insulin will bind to the MPH and it decreases the action. So once you mix those insulins together, they're gonna get to work and they're gonna start working. So um, if they do that in the um, insulin syringe, then you're going to decrease the effects of the insulin. So you always wanna make sure that you administer that insulin five to 10 minutes after you actually draw it up. Um, the other point to keep in mind is that you want to check the patient's blood sugar for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and make sure that they're not hypoglycemic. That is like point number one. Make sure you star that, you remember that. Um, if you get a question on the NCLEX about administering insulin, um, you never, ever, ever administer insulin without checking the blood glucose level first. You always, always, always want to check the blood glucose level first. And then if the um, glucose level is outside of the doctor's orders and the parameters that they have set for the insulin. Obviously, do not give that insulin. You want to hold it and you want to contact the physician to let them know what the blood sugar levels are. So next, so you have clear insulins and then you have your cloudy insulin. So your clear insulins are going to be your rapid acting and your, um, your short acting. So I remember clear and fast. Um, that is going to be your clear insulins, your rapid and your short acting. And then uh, you have your cloudy insulins, which are going to be your intermediate acting and your, your long acting. So um, slow and cloudy is what um, how I remember it. And then you want to remember the mnemonic RN, so regular to MPH. So like I said, typically you're going to be mixing those short acting and those intermediate acting. So your short acting is going to be your clear insulin. So um, RN, you want to first draw up, you want to first draw up your clear insulins, um, and then you're going to draw up your cloudy insulins. Um, and the reason why we do that is because if you draw up that cloudy insulin first, you can get a film on the syringe. So you won't be able to um, adequately see the um, number of units on that syringe. So you have a high chance of misdosing the patient if you draw up those cloudy insulins first. So you always wanna make sure that you draw up the clear because you're gonna be able to have good visualization of the numbers on that, um, on that insulin syringe um when you draw up the clear first so make sure that you keep that in mind it's always regular to mph rn clear to cloudy all right and then um again just remember that you have five to ten minutes to administer this insulin after you have drawn it up because it's going to start working right away so make sure five to ten minutes after you draw it up you want to make sure that you are ready um, to give it to the patient All right, and then I do have a full lecture where I go into a little bit more detail about diabetes and insulin management on my YouTube channel. So if you have not already checked that out, make sure you go over to my YouTube channel and subscribe after this live. So you can find me um, just at youtube.com slash nurse Kelly Tyrell. Um, and again, I will be finishing up my endocrine series this week. So I have the diabetes and insulin management video coming out tomorrow. And then on Friday, we are going to do some NCLEX style um, endocrine review questions. So make sure that you tune into, um, tune into my YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe. I would really appreciate it. It would help me out a lot. All right, so I talked about my cheat sheets a little bit in my university community, and some of you might have been saying, what the heck is university? I don't even know what that is or what that means. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my university community and how it can really help you excel in nursing school, um, and also it can help you um, pass your NCLEX on your next attempt, which is the ultimate goal, right? Everyone wants to pass on, on their next attempt in the minimum amount of questions. So. 
Um, just a little bit about my university community. Uh, so you're going to get coaching community and content. So I had initially created a group on Facebook. Some of you uh, might be watching this on Facebook. You might be members on Facebook. Um, I created a group on Facebook and um, it was going really great. We grew like really quickly. We have over 6,000 members in my Facebook group, which is really awesome. Um, but there were some challenges uh, being on Facebook. And uh, one of those challenges was uh, distractions, which I had talked about earlier. Um, also just limited engagement um, in the group. As we grew bigger, um, Facebook only shows a percentage of your post to a certain percentage of members in your Facebook group. So um, members in my Facebook group weren't really seeing as many posts as I would like. Um, and also there just was more things that I felt that I could do by going over to our own private community, our own private space. Um, it could be more of a personal type experience um, and I can offer, you know, more of that, you know, coaching community and content that I'm going to talk about in just a second here. But um, so for coaching, so I'm in that group every day, um, all day long, uh, talking to you guys, answering any questions that you have, um, helping to guide you on the on the right um, path and direction, making sure that, um, you know, I'm holding you accountable to studying for your NCLEX or um, studying for your next next nursing school exam. Um, I'm pushing out, um, I'm pushing out uh, content uh, every day, every week, every month. We're gonna go into the content piece in just a second. Um, but I have some really great uh, nurses over there, nursing students over there, and they're from all around the world, everywhere from you know the pre-nursing student all the way up to the student that is um, preparing to take their NCLEX. Um, maybe first time test takers. I have some repeat test takers in there. So I have a really good, strong community of nurses that you can network with and lean on for support as well. Um, so next let's go into the content because um, I work really hard to curate this content for you guys. Um, so this is what our daily content schedule looks like. So this is our core content, if you will. Um, so Sundays I have nursing blogs that come out and I personally write those. They're about, um, you can expect some education in there, um, also about my experience as a nurse um, and also some inspiration for um, aspiring nurses. They're just, um, have a little, a mixture of everything, but I personally write those and release those on Sundays. And then um, on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so during the week, we have NCLEX practice questions of the day. So I alternate the different format type questions. So I have SATA questions, multiple choice, fill in the blank, ordering, and calculations questions. So you get some um, hands-on practice with detailed rationales um, while we do these questions every day. And then uh, also on Monday, I post um, an engaging poll or ask a question. So I really like to hear your feedback on different topics uh, from you guys. And that just helps me you know, better improve the group and better improve my content. I really wanna hear um, what you guys wanna see more of. So, and it also helps you guys get to know each other a little bit more too. Uh, and then Tuesday, I have my Quick Tip Tuesdays. So um, I post uh, different, you know, nursing tips uh, that you guys will need to know, whether it be from assessments or lifespans or vital signs or um, hematology, uh, medications, pharmacology, diseases. Uh, just um, little quick tips that will help make your job as a nurse or nursing student. Yeah. Um, a little bit easier. And then Wednesday, so um, I'm starting these, I'm calling them webinar Wednesdays. So we're gonna do, you know, study uh, with me's every week um, and the topic will rotate depending on uh, kind of my focus for uh, that month. So um, that is going to be on Wednesdays. And then on Thursdays, um, I post my educational videos and the lectures and exclusive to this group only is um, the post lecture quizzes. So uh, that is posted every Thursday and Friday. You'll be able to test your knowledge and make sure that you are actually retaining the information from my lectures 
um, you'll get the post lecture quizzes. And then Saturday, um, I'm really big on inspiring uh, quotes and just things that you know keep us uplifted and make us feel good. So uh, on Saturdays, I do post the um, inspirational quote cards. And then as far as monthly content, so how it works in my university group is, like I said, I have a theme or um, a focus for uh, the month. So typically I'm focusing on two different topics. So this month happens to be endocrine and calculation. So um, I release a what I call a digital bundle um, every month, and then it's available that you can print and download for the entire month. Um, and then in that bundle, you can expect to have things like flashcards, infographics, physical assessments, practice questions, worksheets, skills checklists, and procedure assessments. So right now, my endocrine and my calculations bundle are available for download. Um, so that will be until the end of the month. And then the next thing that I want to talk about, another really cool feature of my university community is our ambassador program that I have worked really hard to develop. And it was just a way for me to give back to you guys for um, referring uh, new members to the community. So I developed this really cool ambassador program. So um, just a couple reasons why uh, you should join and refer to university is um, because uh, who doesn't want to learn with their friends? So there's a level of comfort in that once, you know, if you refer your uh, nursing student friends, um, there's a level of comfort in being able to learn from your friends and then you can kind of discuss the different content that you're learning and you can be on the, the same page with your nursing journey. And also the, the more the merrier. So um, you know, there's there's going to be more uh, engagement, more opportunities to do things like having live classes, um, you know, one on one coaching and things like that. All these things that I want to do um, in the future. Um, so the the more students that we have, it's going to make that possible to do that. And my favorite part, which is earning nursing swag or cash. So um, if you become a U Nursity um, ambassador, which means that you start referring um, your friends, then you can uh, earn some um, cash or nursing swag, which I'm gonna go over. Um, and I will put a disclaimer that your referrals, um, they must sign up for the monthly or annual plan in order to be eligible, um, but uh, yeah, it's a really cool incentive and you can have some really cool, let me move this thing down here. Um, you can have some really cool uh, nursing swag that I know that I loved when I um, was in nursing school and also as a bedside nurse. So I picked out some really cool things for you guys. So the first tier is going to be the bronze heartthrob. So when you refer to members, you can get $20 in cash, or you can opt to get the nursing swag, which is the um, pen lights and the bandage scissors, and also a retractable um, badge holder. And then the second tier is going to be um, the silver lifesaver. So that is when you refer 10 members. Um, you can either opt to get the $75 in cash or you can get the uh, insulated tumblers there and also a stethoscope um, and medical accessories travel case, which is really convenient to keep your um, stethoscope um, kind of contained and preserve the life of your stethoscope in that case. So I thought that was really cool. And then the next tier, if you refer 25 members, that is the gold tier. So then you can get $150 in cash. Um, or you can opt to get the Classic 3 stethoscope and the laptop um, backpack with the USB charging port, which I thought was not only good for nursing students carrying their books, but also um, if you you know plan on traveling, you can use it as like a travel backpack. I thought that would be really convenient. But the Classic 3 stethoscope is uh, my favorite stethoscope. It's the one that I've used my entire nursing career, and I had it in that pink color. Um, probably for about, I don't know, 10 years or so um, into me being a nurse and my dog actually chewed a hole in it. So I replaced it with, it's actually hanging on my door back there. Um, I replaced it with uh, the same classic three, it's just in a navy color. 
And the next tier is gonna be the Platinum Flu Fighters. So that is a $300 um, value. So you can either get the $300 in cash or you can get a $150 Dance Go gift card and also a $150 Grey's Anatomy um, uh, scrub uh, gift card, which I um, absolutely loved my Dance Goes and I love my Grey's Anatomy scrub. So I know that you will love them too. And then the next tier is going to be if you were for 75 members, um, so that is going to be a $400 value. That's going to be a $400 value, so you can either opt for the $400 in cash or you can get an Apple iPad 8th generation. Um, and I love my iPad. I do have an iPad. It's very um, useful and convenient, so, but you can also opt for the $400 in cash as well. And then the last tier is the Elite Healthcare Heroes. So that is if you refer 100 members, which I know is quite a lot of members, but if you manage to get up to 100 members, then um, you will get $550 either in cash or the Apple Watch Series 6, which I do have my Apple Watch and I love my Apple Watch too. So, um, yeah, and then referring is super easy. Um, if you guys are not a member of my community yet, once you join, um, once you join my community, then you uh, there's a tutorial in the welcome section. So um, it'll be I'll walk you through it. It's it's super easy. But just the the quick version of it is um, you're going to click. There's a, a left hand menu here. This is actually if I can figure out how to move my. Um, if I could figure out how to move my camera, I could show you, but um, there is, uh, this is actually a sneak uh, peek inside of university, but there's a menu bar over here. So you would just click that uh, invite menu on the uh, menu bar there. Um, and then you would just enter in the um, email addresses that you wanna send the referral to, and then it already populates with this, um, this message here. So you don't have to worry about you know, typing out a message and what you're gonna say, it already uh, sends the message there. And then if you don't wanna send by email and you wanna send through text or you wanna send through um, a Facebook Messenger, you can actually copy this link and then you can send it directly to, um, you can send it directly to uh, your referral. So this um, community is, like I said, it's for um, anyone who is thinking about becoming a nurse, but they're a little unsure and they, they just kind of want to get some support and resources to check it out all the way up to the first level nursing student um, through um, graduating and also my NCLEX um, uh, preparation uh, students as well. So this is going to give you a little bit um, more day-to-day -day interaction um, versus what I'm gonna be talking about next, which is my self-paced NCLEX and Chill review course. So uh, this is such an amazing resource um, with amazing results. And there we go. Let me move that up out of the way so that way you can see. So I'm really, really proud of this review course. Um, I created this review course um, a few years ago using all of the best resources um, that I had used to pass my NCLEX and um, incorporated a lot of test taking strategies and skills that I applied, which helped me pass my NCLEX in the minimum amount of questions um, when I took my NCLEX. So uh, this is a really, really great resource. I have my active students, I have um, just about 600 active students right now. I've had thousands of students that have passed through um, and have passed their NCLEX. Um, so this is the NCLEX and Chill Review. So I'm just gonna talk about it a little bit. So we are very proud to have a 99.3% uh, success rate. So students who um, stay in this course um, and really use it to the fullest and the best of their ability and take you know, my guidance and instruction, um, we have a 99.3% success rate, which is really awesome and something to be very, very proud of. Um, and I am offering, uh, let me move this up here, there we go, okay. So um, we do offer a 100% pass guarantee, which makes us a little bit unique from other um, programs out there. There's a lot of programs that don't offer a pass guarantee, but I'm so confident that it will help you pass your NCLEX that I do offer a 100% pass guarantee. 
Um, so who is this review for? So it's for first time test takers, it's for repeat test takers, it's for international test takers, and really any busy student who needs to study when it's convenient for them. So this is, I'll go into it in just a little bit, but this is um, a self-paced, self-guided um, program. And I created this specifically um, for those busy students, which I know that we are all so busy. And sometimes live classes are not always convenient um, for you. And you might prefer to have something where you can, um, you can uh, review when it's convenient for you. So, and we also have proven, proven results guaranteed. So again, I'm so confident that you pass. Um, if you don't pass, then you'll maintain access into my program completely for free. Um, so I will not charge you any uh, subscription fees or any additional fees. Um, if you don't pass, then you are going to stay in this program completely for free until um, you do end up passing. So this is really a comprehensive review. So it is going to be your all-in-one resource that is going to help you pass your NCLEX on your next attempt. And it covers all of the major topics that you can expect to find um, on the NCLEX. And I'll show you a little preview um, in just a minute here of what are all of the topics that I do cover. But it includes all of the tools that you will need. It has um, content, it's very content rich. It has NCLEX simulated questions. Uh, PDFs that you can print and download, and also a known instructor. It's not just the name of you know uh, the name of a review, and you never get to interact with um, with the instructor. I'm talking to you guys all the time through Messenger. If you ever have a question as you're navigating through the course, I always encourage you to reach out to me and send me a message. Um, so a lot of programs don't have that. They don't have that known instructor. Um, and I have 35 hours of core video content. So this is a very in-depth, all-inclusive review. Um, there's over 40 videos uh, for you to watch, or some of you prefer the audio-only option, which is perfect for on the go. So I know some of my students say, oh, I love listening to you in the car on my way to work or on my way home from work, or while I'm at the gym, um, I just hear your voice. Um, in my ear at the gym. So um, you can also do the audio only option, which is really nice for, um, for my learners that learn best by just listening. Um, or if you prefer the visual, um, then I do have the videos uh, there for you as well. So you can pick whichever one you would like. And then the 1000 NCLEX simulated questions. So these are spread across 20 assessments and they test your readiness um, to sit for the NCLEX. So um, I have um, different question type quizzes in the introduction section. I also have five main weekly questions that are, or five main weekly tests that are 100 question tests. And then I also have, um, after each uh, section, I have a mini quiz as well. So these questions are spread across 20 different assessments and you'll be able to track your progress. You can retake these um, tests and quizzes as many times as you'd like. Um, and hopefully the goal is that you will improve. And I tell my students to shoot for 75% or higher on these tests. That's gonna show a good retention of the information and will let you know that you are ready to sit for your NCLEX. And the 12 printable PDFs. So these are extensive PDFs, you guys. These are not like, you know, two page PDFs. Some of these, page, some of these PDFs are, you know, 70 pages in length. Um, these are very in-depth pages that is going to condense all this information for you so that way you have all of those need to know NCLEX facts in one um, location. And I have 12 of them. Um, and you can download them, you can print them. A lot of my students print them and use them to take notes as they're going through the different videos. Um, so again, these are, these are gonna be all of your need to know facts condensed in one location. And uh, I already talked touched on this, but this is self-paced, so you can study when it's convenient for you. And I will tell you that the average completion time is about four weeks. If you study for one hour a day, you can complete this course um, in a four week time. But you, of course you can do it much faster if you 
um, study for longer than an hour a day. That just tends to be the average. I tell my students, shoot for an hour a day. Um, anything over that is really going to be based on your schedule. You don't want to study too much to the point where it's actually stressing you out, where you're like overdoing it. Um, because if you are distracted because you are stressed, because you are stretching yourself so thin um, by studying for hours and hours and hours a day, that is not going to be conducive for you to retain information. So um, I say do try to do an hour a minimum if it's not going to stress you out too much. Shoot for an hour um, a day. And then as far as your maximum, it really depends on your lifestyle. It depends on your, your circumstances, your situation. I don't put a maximum amount of time uh, suggested for you to study. But I do have some detailed um, different uh, study tips and tricks um, in my course that I do go over as far as like um, the amount of time in one session that you should study um, and, and different uh, study techniques that you can use. So um, this, again, this is just kind of a snapshot of that core curriculum. Um, so you can see that this is just the introduction section. I have everything from um, uh, talking about how to um, obsess your NCLEX success, to meeting your mentor, to different uh, a motivational mindset video, which my students absolutely love to help combat some of that test anxiety that's so common um, with the NCLEX. Also, um, some um, detailed test taking strategies that I have in there, uh, pa practice passing principles that so we talk all about the different ABCs, Maslow's hierarchy, the nursing process. These are things that you are going to want to use and, um, uh, and memorize when you are answering different um, prioritization and delegation questions um, on your NCLEX. So you can see as you go through here, there is, um, I have five weeks total here. And then I also have the bonus section with all the PDFs. So, all right, so now that I told you about all of the amazing uh, benefits to the uh, community and also to um, the NCLEX and Chill review, um, I want to offer you guys um, some special uh, discounts uh, for attending this webinar, for sticking with me and, um, and joining the study session. So um, let's start with the university community. So I want to give you guys a 50% discount. So if you join today, you're going to get 50% off of the monthly or annual membership plan. Um, so that's $9.99 a month, and it's regularly $19.99 a month. So I'm taking 50% off. There's also a yearly option where you can sign up for $99 a year, which is regularly $199. Um, and you're also going to get two months free if you sign up for the annual membership plan. So that is the benefit to doing the annual. And this is going to be valid for the first 10 members only. And I'm also going to give you guys a 30 day free trial. Typically, I only offer seven days, but I'm going to give you guys a 30 day free trial. Um, so just for, again, like I said, joining in um, on this um, study session. So um, yeah, valid for the first 10 members. Again, you're gonna get the coaching, the community, and access to all of that um, exclusive content. And then for the uh, NCLEX and Chill review course, so um, I wanna give you guys a 70% discount. So I have really discounted this course because I wanna make sure that you have the resources that you need to pass. I want you guys to get your license. I want you guys to pass the NCLEX. So I am discounting this to 70% off. So if you join today, lifetime access with the pass guarantee is going to be $147. That is a $497 value. Um, and again, we do have the 99.3% success rate. And also I offer the 100% pass guarantee. So you'll stay in the program completely for free until you pass. And you'll have access to number one rated content, the 40 videos that I talked about, 35 hours of core content, the option to do audio only, um, and the self-paced, self-guided course. Also with the 1,000 NCLEX simulated questions um, with the self-graded assessments and the 12 PDFs with all that you need to know um, for to pass your NCLEX. All right, well, that is all the time that I have. It did go over a little bit longer than what I expected. Um, but if you guys um, have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll stay on for just a minute um, and to see if you guys have any 
any questions. Let me take a look here. Um, I heard that the new NCLEX is much harder. Um, a lot of select all that apply. I start nursing school next January. We'll be sitting for the NCLEX 2023 or January 2024. Can you help with that? So I'm actually attending, um, let me turn this on. There we go. I'm actually attending the NCLEX conference for um, nurse educators at the end of this month on the 30th. So we're going to be talking about the new structure of the NCLEX and the format. Um, I will say that I did not hear um, that the new test is necessarily going to be harder per se. It's, I think it's still going to be the same type of grading system. Um, but there are going to be, I think, a new format to the NCLEX, so a different type of um, question. And I did also hear that. Checks left. Um, I did also hear that uh, they will be issuing um, uh, they will be issuing they will be issuing. Um, partial credit for SATA. So, but that is just a rumor. I don't know that for sure. But like I said, I am going to be attending the um, NCLEX um, educator conference at the end of the month. So if you want the details on that, um, I am going to be sharing that exclusively in my university community group only. So if you want the details on that, uh, make sure that you head on over to uh, my university. The link is going to be um, in the description of this live. So make sure that you join my university in order to hear all of those exclusive um, details and juicy details about the upcoming versions of the NCLEX. All right, so I don't see any other questions right now that are coming through. So um, I think we are gonna call it a night there. So thank you guys again so much for tuning in. If you did miss the beginning of this um, study with me, then it will be reposted. So um, you don't have to worry about that. I will have it um, all posted for you. So thanks again so much for uh, sticking with me and tuning in. Chat with you soon. Bye, lightsabers.